Hey, Vibrant. It's good to be together. If you're online, throw Hey Drew in the chat. If we've not uh, met yet, my name is Drew. I'm the lead pastor here, and it is a great day for a great day. So it's good to be together. Um, hey, I know many of you uh, pray for my family, and you've been praying for my son uh, Ronan and Judah, and, uh, and I, I just got to share, like, I know I've told you this before, but we feel like we are empowered through your prayers. And so if you've taken a commitment to be praying for me and my family, gosh, we so value that. Um, but we have had a major milestone in our family's history just this past week. Um, my son Ronan had an epilepsy disorder, had surgery on, in December, and uh, has been over a year seizure-free. Praise God. It's going well. It's going great. Um, but over that epilepsy journey, he has been on a number of neurological medications to try to offset the seizures. And at one point, he was on six different medications three times a day. And, and no four- and five-year-old ever needs to be on that many medications. Um, but slowly, we have been weaning him off his medications. And just this past week, we gave him his very last dose of seizure medication. Can I show you the video? It's so fun. Let's watch the video. Ronan, it's the last one. Are you ready? Sorry. One more time, and then we're all done. Ready? Push. You did it. Ronan, say, all done. Look at mama. Can you look at me? Hey. Mama. Mama. Say, all done. All done. No more meds. You're all done. Can I have a high five? No. <laughs> <laughs> we celebrate that together? Oh my gosh. All the feels right now. Our God is a miracle working God. And so I, I just wanted to share that God is good. And I know as much as this has been my story's family, it's been our story together. So thanks so much for praying with us and continuing to cheer us on. God is good. Amen? Amen. Hey, we're in a series talking about God's goodness called Four Second Chances, which is all about uh, the life of Jesus through the book of John. And if you've never spent any time in the book of John, it's told from a unique perspective by the disciple that self-titles himself the one that Jesus loved. Seems a little cocky on the outset, but I think... John had a deep grasp and understanding of the love that Jesus had for him. And so we have been working through it, and we're now in chapter 2. We're calling this The Party. We're calling this The Party, and we're going to be in John chapter 2, 1 through 12. I'm really psyched for it. Y'all love a party? Come on, y'all love a party? I love a party. I love a party. Uh, let me ask this question before we get rolling in the message. Uh, what do you think heaven is going to be like? Have you ever thought of that? If you haven't thought of that, I think you should. Uh, we are created beings that are made for eternity. Did you know that? I heard one pastor say that our life is a grain of sand on the beach of eternity. Hello. The beach of eternity is going to be a long time. And so we are created people trying to embrace eternal realities right here and right now. So the place where we're going to spend much of our eternity, if you're with Jesus is heaven. Now, what do we think heaven's going to be like? Or we think we're going to be these uh, chubby angels, cartoons, or whatever, playing a harp and flapping our wings around, maybe? Uh, will we be working? I don't know. Some of you are like, I hope not. Uh, we're going to be fishing. Are we going to be golfing? Uh, I know there'll be baseball there, because that's definitely God's sport. Hello. Um, we'll be reunited with those that have gone before us. I hope so. I'm eager to see my grandfather again. Some of my church people, you may respond that heaven is going to be a big, long worship service. And some of you not-so-church people may be like, that doesn't sound real cool to me. <laughs> Have you ever heard Bart Millard's song from Mercy Me called I Can Only Imagine? Ah, it's all the feels, and it's a beautiful song. But one of the lyrics is, I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes would see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. And you can hear within the framework of the song that the centerpiece of heaven is going to be Jesus. I don't fully know, friends, what heaven's is gonna, heaven is going to be like, but I do know one thing, and I'm really confident of, confident of this, is that Jesus is going to be there. And that's good news. And if Jesus is going to be there, we're probably going to do what Jesus wants to do. So what are we going to do in, in heaven? 
Well, this is the year of the follow for our vibrant family, and we're seeking to draw closer to Jesus, to know him more, to know him more completely, and to follow him deeply. And my guess is, is that if that is Jesus is going to be there in heaven, then he'd have a good feel of what's going to be like and what's going to happen. And so when Jesus walked this earth 2,000 years ago, there were miracles and moments that I believe gave us a glimpse into what heaven is going to be like. And this moment, friends, that we're going to read in the text today is actually going to be one of those moments that gives us a glimpse of what heaven is going to be like. You want to dig in it with me? It's going to be a good day. Go ahead and open your Bibles or you swipe your Bible apps open to John chapter 2. Let me get mine open here. John chapter 2. Now, if you look at the top here, this title, anybody see that title here? What's that say? Jesus turns water into, what's he turned it into? Wine. Wine. Somebody say amen. Amen. Now, uh, what is the emotional reaction that comes to mind when we mention alcohol in church? (laughs) Some of you are like, I'm not so sure I can say something about that in church, okay? Uh, There's certainly some hesitations when it comes to this conversation around alcohol. and, And so before we even dive into the text today, I thought I'd give us just some helpful framework for the Bible and alcohol, okay? Is that okay? We're going to frame this together uh, before we dive into the text. The Bible and alcohol. Well, what do we know about the Bible and alcohol? First, Scripture says in Hebrews 13 that we are to honor and obey our leaders. So if you live in the United States, which I'm uh, anticipating most of you do, but I know we have friends in other countries online, what's the legal drinking age? 21, yeah, yep. So it's wise to stick to that, and scriptures uphold that we should, uh, uh, we should honor and obey our leaders, and we should not uh, drive over the, uh, what's the, the, the blood alcohol content? What's that? What's, what's, the, what's the legal blood alcohol content? I looked at TJ like she knew. She's like, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> 0.08. It's 0.08. So it's wise to stick to those standards, okay, y'all? Just wise to stick to those standards. Uh, we also know in Scripture, Paul says that we shouldn't get drunk in Ephesians 5.18. Now, let me be clear. God is not anti-alcohol, okay? Some of my German friends in the room should say amen, all right? But God is anti-let alcohol tarnish your reality and ruin or run your life. In Ephesians 5, Paul says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I've had church friends push back on me, and they're like, well, Drew, listen, in Scripture, whenever we see this word wine, it literally is grape juice, because it's just watered-down wine that is grape juice. Now, this, this word that's used in John 2, which is talking about Jesus turning water into wine, and the same word that Paul uses in Ephesians 5 for wine, those are actually the same words for wine. So if, it, if it's literally translated grape juice... Uh, Paul says, don't drink too much grape juice and get drunk. It's going to take a whole lot of grape juice for me to get drunk. Uh, You'd likely drown before you'd you'd get drunk. So God is not anti-alcohol, but it is clear that we are not to get drunk. Another uh, lesson in Scripture that we know is that we should be wise and filled with the Spirit, as Paul says. I know one of my buddies says, Drew, I don't drink because I I don't need help making dumb decisions. (laughs) <laughs> and I love that. You know, typically when someone drinks too much, they're not making, you know, the best decisions and they're doing things that they, you know, may have regret in the morning. But it's wise to be filled with the Holy Spirit and approach it in a wiseful way. We do know that we are to enjoy. It's okay to enjoy, but it's not okay to idolize. Now, idolatry is defined as when you make something a God thing. And we could do this with anything, can't we? Can you make a God thing out of our TVs, for sure. Can we make a God thing out of food? Hello, and we overeat. If we're utilizing drink or food or whatever it may be to numb something in us or to avoid something that we should be actually facing, then I think we're borderline idolatry here in that we are to only find our respite and our source of strength and identity in Christ and in Christ alone, not in a drink or in a TV or food or anything else. And then the last thing I'll leave you with is before you drink or choose to drink is ask, is it harmful? And if it's going to be harmful to someone around you, if it's going to be harmful to you, it's just wise to just say, no thanks. Um, I know I've got friends that have a history of alcoholism in their family, and so they've just chosen for me that I'm not going to drink. And I respect that decision, and that's totally okay to do. 
So as we approach this conversation around Jesus turning water into wine, I thought that was a helpful framework for us. Um, and we're about to see Jesus do something super, super cool. So let me give you some context in John 2 if you've missed the series leading up to this point. Jesus is about 30 years old. He was uh, born to a teenage uh, girl named Mary, married to a carpenter named Joseph, and they grew up in a town called Nazareth. And, and Jesus is just starting his ministry. He's been baptized, and he's called several of his disciples to begin to follow him. So his ministry is about to start, and this ministry would last for Jesus about three years or so. Now Jesus here in John chapter 2 is about to do his very first miracle. Very first miracle. I'm pretty excited about it. John 2, let's go to verse 1. Y'all with me? Everybody say yes, Drew. Cool, I'm just making sure you're good. All right. The next day, so we're in the the first week of Jesus's ministry here. This is likely day seven, maybe a Sabbath day. We're not entirely sure. There was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. So this was a few miles from Jesus's hometown. Jesus's mother, everybody say, "That's that's Mary. Mary, she was there. And Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. Now, we can make an assumption on the outside of this text that this may have been a, a close family member's wedding or a friend's wedding, but weddings back then are different than weddings today. Weddings back then were like a whole week affair. I mean, it was a big celebration, okay? And they sought to invite everybody that they could to come to this wedding. And wedding celebrations, they were a big deal. Uh, there, was, there was much celebration together. And we see right on the outset that Jesus is a guest. And I didn't want to glance over this because I actually love this picture of Jesus, that Jesus is simply a guest at a wedding. I think this might have been the best decision that this newly married couple has ever made, is inviting Jesus to their wedding. Amen, somebody? It's a pretty good decision to make. And so Jesus was just starting his ministry, and what I love about Jesus is he could have said that he was too busy for a week-long celebration like this. He could have said, I'm, I've got too many important things to do, so I'm not going to go. But we learned right out of the gate here that Jesus is not a recluse. He goes to the celebration. He goes to the party. He goes to the gathering. He goes to the event. And what I love about that and how it encourages you and me is that life is meant to be lived with one another. It's meant to be lived with each other, celebration, and in these critical moments like this. And Jesus didn't omit himself from these moments. And I love that Jesus just leans into them. So let's continue reading. This wasn't a perfect wedding, okay? We're about to see something happen that's going to cause some stress. Here we go, verse 3. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Mary told Jesus they have no more wine. Somebody say, that's a problem. When you run out of wine at this wedding, it's a problem. Now, let me tell you why. You may feel like it would be a problem in 2022, but it was an even bigger deal 2,000 years ago. Because if you would have ran out of wine or food at a wedding celebration back then, it would have been a tremendously shameful thing on the groom's family. See, the groom was responsible for making sure that everything for the wedding was stocked up and looking good for the celebration. And so if they would have ran out of wine, that would have been a major shame on the family. So much so that the bride's family could have turned around and sued the groom's family over it. It's a big deal. Now, for Mary to approach Jesus here, there's a couple of thoughts here. First thing we see is, uh, where's Jesus' dad? Uh, Who's Jesus' dad? Help me out. What's his name? Joseph. Joseph. Where's Joseph at? Why isn't Joseph here? Well, some theologians speculate that Joseph may have already likely passed away by this point, which would have left Mary as a single mom, raising several boys, and even possibly a few girls. So Mary would have leaned really heavily into her oldest firstborn son's resourcefulness. And so it's likely that Jesus took on the trade of his father, and and Jesus likely, as a carpenter, was the primary provider for his family. And so for Mary to approach her son and just simply make this polite ask and just say, hey, Jesus, they're out of wine, This wouldn't have been a weird ask for Mary to make because Mary often leaned into her oldest son's resourcefulness. And so this was a polite, also indirect ask of Mary. Now check out Jesus' reply here, verse 4. Get this. Jesus says, 
dear woman, another translation just says, woman, uh, that's not our problem, Jesus replies. He says, my time has not yet come. Now, upon first read here, it's like, man, this is a little harsh, okay? Some of you husbands in the room are like, maybe I can make this my life verse. If Jesus said it, could I say that to my wife? Hello. Uh, strongly recommend that you don't do that, okay? <laughs> Not wise, all right? But what's up with Jesus' reply here? Just simply saying, dear woman, uh, it's not my time. It's, it, we, don't, we don't need to worry about this. It's not our problem. See, Jesus, using the terminology, dear woman, it doesn't necessarily translate super well into English. It was not an impolite word to, to, to call his mother that. It would actually have been like, ma'am, or it would have been very polite to say something like that. But Jesus is clearly saying like, hey, here's the line here, Mary. My time has not yet come. And he's saying it very gentle way. He's not saying it like a, like a crass, very direct way. But what I, what, I, what I think Jesus is saying here and what the declaration I think he's leaning into with you and with me is as Jesus starts his ministry, his freedom in his ministry is free from any kind of human agenda or human advice or human manipulation, even his own mother. Now, when Jesus says the time has not yet come, this will become a recurring theme throughout the biography of Jesus and John, is that he's referring to the time, which he's specifically referencing his crucifixion, saying the time's not quite yet for me to go to the cross. It's a theme that would be recurring. And so Jesus' response to Mary is, hey, I'm not quite sure it's time yet. And I love Mary's approach or her response to Jesus in this moment. See, Jesus, listen to this, friends. Mary, in verse 3, approaches Jesus as her son. But in verse 5, what we're about to read is she responds to Jesus as her Lord. I love this. Check out what Mary says in verse 5 here. She says, but his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Mary responds in that moment as a believer. She initially came to Jesus because he was her son. And this just would have been a simple ask, like, hey, could you make a run for some wine? But in the response here in this moment, her response is one of a believer. And Jesus is going to honor her faith. What I love about Mary's response here is Mary simply encourages the students, the servants to consider that whatever Jesus asks or commends them to do, that they should do it, because Jesus, he's Lord. And whatever he says will be. And what I think is an encouragement for you and for me is whatever, listen friends, whatever you're navigating, whatever event or circumstance that may be difficult for you, what would it look like for us to have the faith of Mary? That simply says, Jesus, whatever you say, we'll do. Wherever you go, we'll follow. Whatever you have me to do, I'll do. What if we had faith like that? And so Jesus, friends, he's going to respond to Mary. And here's the miracle that happens, verse 6. Standing nearby, there were six stone water jars you'd used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold about 20 to 30 gallons. So we got jars that upwards of 150 to 180 gallons. And what Jesus is doing here is he sees these six stone jars there, and he says, let's fill those up. And these were used for Jer Jewish ceremonial washing, would have been, helped wash your exterior clean. It would have been much like, you know, you'd be at a wedding and you'd realize there are no wine and Jesus goes, hey, there's a baptistry, uh, let's fill that up. And it's a little weird that Jesus would say, fill up the ceremonial, like, like buckets here, all right? Like this is, these are, these are holy buckets, right? Like they asked to fill them up, but Jesus says, fill them up. And watch what happens next, verse 7. Jesus told the servants, he says, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he says, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies or the wedding planner or the head, the head servant, all right? So the servants followed Jesus' instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, hello, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, they knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he says. Then why, when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine? But you, why have you kept the best for last? Why have you saved the best for now? This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time 
Jesus, get this, reveals his glory. And his disciples believed him. After the wedding, he went to Capernaum for a few days with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. This first miracle from Jesus, friends, listen to this. It was not a big public spectacle. I mean, if I'm the son of God, and I'm about to do my very first miracle in public, I'm going to make it a big deal, right? Like, I'm maybe starting with the feeding of the 5,000, because a lot of people are going to see the miracle, right? Not Jesus. Jesus simply does it in the background. The only people that were actually aware of what was happening was the servants, Mary, and a few disciples. And he chooses to do it quietly in this private way. And note the responses from the servants and from the disciples. See, the servants, they saw the signs, but they did not notice Jesus' glory. And yet the disciples, they see Jesus' glory behind the sign, and they choose to believe. They choose to believe. Now, with our time that we've got left, uh, as Jesus is performing this miracle, right, this turning water into wine, uh, what he would typically do when he would have a sign or a miracle of sorts is that he would typically have a message or a sermon following it explaining the miracle. Now, for this one, we don't actually have that. Like, Jesus didn't, or John didn't record it for us, but Jesus did share it later. And so what I'd love to do is I'd actually like to make some statements of what Jesus may have said following this miracle. What the heck does it mean? And what's it mean for you and for me? Does that sound good? So if you're taking notes, write this first thing down. Uh, Number one, we learn that Jesus brings internal transformation. And I would even add on top of that, if you're taking notes, that Jesus brings internal fulfillment as well. See those jars that Jesus used? Those jars were used for washing. They were meant to wash you from the outside. Now the, the wine ran out, and all that Israel had left were six empty water pots. Now those water pots, they were held for external ceremonial washing, but they could provide nothing for the internal dirt that they had inside, for internal fulfillment, for internal joy. See, in this miracle, Jesus brought fullness to the people where there was emptiness. Jesus brought joy where there was disappointment. He brought something internal for that which was only external. See, Jesus was going after the heart and your inside rather than what you're bringing from your outside. And this is actually informs much of how we approach ministry today. We, we often say that you don't have to have it all together before you get to Jesus. Because Jesus loves to transform people from the inside out. But I think we as human beings place judgments from the outside in, don't we? That Jesus would much rather go after the heart and internal transformation and fulfillment first before he then gets to external behavioral modification. That he transforms us from the inside out rather than the outside in. See, we, we have this statement here at Vibrant. We say, no perfect people allowed. We got any perfect people in the room? No? Good, because no perfect people allowed except for Jesus. And so if we believe that no perfect people are allowed, then we have to believe that everyone has a seat at the table here. And so our mission at Vibrant is connecting everyone to Jesus. And this word everyone is a big deal to us. It means that there's nobody too far from the good news of Jesus. There's nobody too far from the grace of Jesus. There's nobody too far from the internal transformation work that Jesus can do in us and through us. He's after our hearts. And he's after your internal transformation before your external modification. That's the first learning, all right? Y'all still with me? Okay, I didn't lose you? All right, that's number one. Number two, this is the best part, all right? This is the best learning from this text, and I love it. Number two, Jesus ups the fun factor. Somebody say amen to that. Jesus ups the fun factor. Interestingly enough, in my study, I was looking that there's a unique parallel of Jesus and Moses in this. Did you know uh, Moses, when Moses went to free the Israelites from Egyptian captivity, he had 10 plagues or 10 miracles that happened. Do you know what the first plague that happened for Egypt? It was turning the Nile River into blood. Somebody say, yuck. (laughs) And that was the first miracle that Moses performed to free the Israelites. There's a unique parallel here that Jesus did something similar, but Moses' miracle of turning the water into blood was was a statement of judgment for the Egyptians. But Jesus turning water into wine here 
What is it? It's a statement of grace. It's a statement of joy. It's a statement of fun. It's a statement of a new way of doing things. He ups the fun factor. Now, friends, let me, let me lean into this with you. If, you. if you don't like parties, if you're anti-fun, <laughs> you're going to hate heaven. <laughs> oh, you're going to hate heaven. Because heaven, heaven, let me be clear, heaven's going to be full of laughter. We're going to be laughing constantly. We're going to be hugging each other. There's going to be joy. There's going to be feasting. There's going to be drink. There's going to be life. There's going to be smiles. There's going to be fullness happening in heaven. Let me ask this question. Have you ever been to a party that you never wanted it to end? I I could sit down with my introverts and I could ask my introverts, have you ever been to a party that you've never wanted to end? Each of you would say, (laughs) no. I've wanted each one to end. (laughs) I I asked my wife that same question and and she said, well, maybe. And we referred back to our honeymoon. Our honeymoon was a party that we did not want to end. We did one of those, uh, we went to the coast and we did one of those, they call them all-inclusive joints. Have you been to these? All-inclusive? Where like all the food and all the drink, it's just all taken care of. So the first time we get there, we're just kids. We don't really understand like what the all-inclusive thing is. We get there and we sit down for this really nice dinner and I'm pretty sure I had like this, this surf and turf like, like steak and, and lobster tail and it was delicious. And then we wake up the next morning and we show up for breakfast and they've got an omelet bar. Ugh, I'm getting hungry thinking about it. And then, and then we go roll ourselves because we're full from breakfast over to the beach and we just lay on the beach. And as we're laying on the beach, uh, a woman walks up and he says, or she says, excuse me, can I get you guys anything? And I said, what can you, what can you get us? <laughs> and she said, well, I can bring you food and drink. And I looked at her and I said, is the Pope Catholic? <laughs> Would love for that to happen. And so the whole week, friends, we laid around eating and drinking and doing nothing. And it was a party that we never wanted to end. Friends, the kingdom of God, let me, let me be clear. The kingdom of God is like a party where Jesus provides everything and everything is awesome. Oh, I can't wait where Jesus brings everything for our joy and fulfillment together with him. Christians, friends, we get to have the most fun together. Why? Because we can party and enjoy each other without any of the guilt the next day. We can laugh with deep-seated joy. If you're, let me, let me, let me shift for a second. If you're in a small group here at Vibrant, one of the most spiritual practices that you can do this week or sometime upcoming, just have a party together. Just have fun together, have a bunch of food, whatever, like do life together. Just have fun together. Have fun as a group. Laugh together. One of my prayers as we're building here in our Landscap campus and and renovating is that God would allow laughter to just encapsulate these walls. Oh my gosh, because if we're having fun and if there's laughter, we are near to Jesus' heart. Why? Because Jesus ups the fun factor. He allows Uh, joy to resonate deep in our bones. He allows us to have fun together. If you're not smiling when you're with Jesus, then I'm not sure you're actually meeting the real Jesus. Because Jesus welcomes us with open arms. He extends grace. He turns water into wine. He He saves the best for last. And he provides everything for our enjoyment and fulfillment with him. And everything that he provides is excellent. Somebody say amen to that. Jesus ups the fun factor. And one of the ways, listen, listen, listen. One of the ways that you can be Jesus to someone this week is to simply up the fun factor wherever you are. Now, you may be looking at me and going, well, Drew, I'm not actually any fun. I'm, 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 not, I'm terrible. I'm, I actually, it's hard for me to laugh. Uh, my wife says I shouldn't smile because it's scary. Um, <laughs> and so if, 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 if upping the fun factor is hard for you, just bring food wherever you go. <laughs> like, you can't walk into a room with donuts and people can't help but laugh or smile, right? Like, if somebody's walking in with donuts, nobody's frowning at donuts, right? Bring food with you. Up the fun factor wherever you go. And just maybe, as we up the fun factor wherever we go, just maybe others may see Jesus. Others may get a glimpse of his grace. 
Others may get to smile when they're sitting in a dark place. And they may get to realize that there is a God who deeply loves them, who's after their heart, and who's after their whole being. Jesus ups the fun factor. Let me close with this, this learning out of John chapter 2, is that Jesus, he reveals his glory for our joy and celebration. Friends, whether you're here on site or you're worshiping online, Jesus wants to give you a richer, fuller picture of himself right now. And friends, when you get that picture of Jesus, when you see him, there is joy that resonates in your bones, regardless of your circumstances. And when we see that Jesus has set us free, that he's giving us good gifts, that he is a a good father who deeply loves us and that we are blessed, we can't help but celebrate. (laughs) We can't help but clap. We can't help but sing. We can't help but laugh. We can't help but smile because Jesus has transformed us. We can't help but carry joy. Why do we do this? Because the grave is empty. Did you know that? Like because the grave is empty, that means Jesus died, was buried in a tomb, it was borrowed for three days, and he rose again. And what that means is all who place their trust in Jesus, you can find freedom for this life. You can find freedom in Jesus. You can find freedom from addiction, from bondage, from shame, from guilt, from from any wonky thoughts that you may have, from, from broken relationships, from your past or your present or whatever you're navigating. Jesus brings freedom for you and for me. And that freedom, friends, is one that gives us joy and is cause for celebration. Amen, somebody? And that kind of celebration, friends, is certainly what's going to be happening in heaven. But what if... We said, we don't want to wait until heaven to celebrate. Let's bring heaven to earth right now. And let's start celebrating right now. Let me close with this. Uh, The prophet Isaiah gives this prophecy several hundred years before Jesus. And it's really a picture of what heaven's going to be like. Can you picture this scene with me? Check this out in Isaiah. He says, but here on this mountain, God of the angel armies will throw a feast for all the people of the world. You'll love a feast. He's going to throw a feast for all the people of the world. A feast, get this, of the best food you've ever had. The finest food. A feast with vintage wines. Hello, it's delicious. The best for last. A feast of seven courses. I don't even know they could do seven courses, but he's got them. A feast lavish with gourmet desserts. Mm, he didn't leave out desserts, y'all. He's got it. Cheesecakes? Yes. And here on this mountain, I'm having too much fun, Aaron. I'm sorry. And here on this mountain, God, this is the best part, God will banish the pall of doom hanging over all the peoples, the shadow of doom darkening all nations. Yes, here it is. He'll banish death forever. And God will wipe every tear from every face. He'll remove every sign of disgrace from his people, wherever they are. Yes, God says so. If you've got pain, if you feel disgrace, if you feel shame, we have a great God who's ready to throw a feast with us. And it's a feast that ups the fun factor that brings joy, but it also heals. And it brings wholeness. And we get to reveal his glory. We get to see it on display. And we get to celebrate with all that we are because the King of kings and Lord of lords is alive and gives us life and life to the full. If you don't know this Jesus, if you've never said yes to Jesus and made a statement of faith, if you've never been baptized, gone all in. We got the, we got the baptistry open, y'all. There's no better day to celebrate. If today's the day, we've got our campus pastor, TJ, she'll be right down front. We've got a blue banner out on the, on the way out that you can talk to the person there at the blue banner. Um, if you're online, uh, go to livevibrant.com slash Jesus, start a conversation there, or just throw something in the chat, and someone would love to chat with you about taking that next step of your faith. Our God's a good God, amen? And he brings us joy, and he helps the fun factor. So let's be people that bring laughter and joy wherever we go. Would you pray with me? 
Father, thanks for the party. <laughs> thanks for uh, preparing a party for me. Thanks for preparing a party for my friends. Thanks for the ways that you reveal yourself in this first miracle of Jesus, turning water into wine. I'm thankful it wasn't water to blood. <laughs> and I'm thankful it was grace and fun and life and the best for last. And so Lord, as we're waiting on this side of heaven, find us faithful to enjoy, to have just a light burden, to have light hearts, to laugh more, to smile often and to share that joy with others because we know that joy is rooted in a real person in, a, in an event of an empty tomb and in the life that we now have in your son Jesus. So may we be people of joy, people of laughter, and people of fun. May it be so, Lord, may it be so. In Jesus' name, and we all said together, amen.